Jerry is the past executive director of the Nebraska Council on Compulsive Gambling. He was the first director of problem gambling for the state of Nebraska, where he created the Gambler's Assistance Program and pioneered the treatment of gambling counseling in Nebraska. In addition, he was appointed and served on the Nebraska's Commission on Problem Gambling. He served on the board of directors for the National Council on Problem Gambling from 2001 to 2008, and he currently serves on the National Council's Legislative Committee, where he helps raise awareness of problem gambling in Washington, D.C. Very important, because as you heard Keith mention, we still, to this date, have no federal funding for this issue. Mr. Bauer Kemper has been providing counseling to gambling families since 1986, and he's published research on the prevalence of problem gambling in the Nebraska Probation Department. He received the First Step Award in 1999 for his work with problem gamblers, and Mr. Bauer Kemper is a nationally recognized expert on problem gambling and has provided training throughout the United States and Southeast Asia. Currently, he's serving as a consultant to the Iowa Disordered Gambling Program, and he's responsible for helping gambling treatment providers help in re-engaging gamblers and their families experiencing issues and problems with gambling. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Jerry Bauerkamper. Thank you. Let me say two things. First of all, I have a cold. It's not COVID. I tested before I came. My wife tested before she came. It's a cold. In today's world, every time we cough, somebody says, oh my God, COVID. But we did test, so we're okay. So if I cough, it's not, you know, you'll, you'll get a run of the mill. We're not ready for it co uh, cold because we've been two years by ourselves and, and, and all of our antibodies are gone. And so I catch this cold and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, do I have COVID? So no, I don't. And my wife is, is, is up in, her, her, in our room and she's a little sick right now. Uh, because I gave it to her. Um, it's one of the few things that I've given her and, and she's not overly grateful. Um, today I wanna to talk about, uh, that's me, um, but, but as, I, as I go through this, I wanna talk about the grief process with gamblers and substance abusers and what's similar and what's not. And so I'm gonna talk while you read this it's a poem I took offline because I stole it, because everything can be stolen offline. Um, um, I Googled it. Um, and that's about the extent of my computer savvy. So now you know why I retired. Um, I've been working with gamblers since 1986. So when these two are standing up here, they're youngsters. They're just babies. Um, I've, this is my 36th year, 34th year, excuse me. Uh, or 36, I don't know, I'm old. Um, and I currently work with the state of Iowa as they are coming out of the pandemic, the number of people that were going to treatment for gambling had plummeted. They went from 600 people to 70 with the pandemic. And they said, well, we have to re-energize this process. And so as, would you like to help us? And I, was going, I said, well, I'm retired and I live in Galveston Island, Texas, and I see the Gulf of Mexico every day out my window. And they, I said, what do you got for me? And they said, well, you can do this via Zoom. And I said, okay, I'll do it. So every time I sit in a meeting, I look out and I see the, the Gulf and the, and the ocean, and I say to myself, I, I actually get paid to work while looking at the water. So, as you're reading through this, this is just a poem, and I, I'm not going to read through it. I, 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 le I left it on, it's on your, your, uh, your handout, so you can use this at any point. I, and so as we go and we finish this, I'll let you read this, and we'll talk about what we're going to do today. Let me talk about grief and recovery. And we're going to talk about what this grief process is, and how they look when they're coming into your office and why sometimes they don't stay in your office and some of the grieving things that have to happen around that. So, let's talk about this first. So, if gambling and substance abuse are so bad, why would we grieve their loss? It makes, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm a person who's just a lay person and I'm out there and, and, and they're going like, well, this is a person that had a, a terrible substance use issue and they lost everything, et cetera, et cetera. Shouldn't they be grateful that they stopped? 
Well, the answer, the answer from, the, from the general public's view is yes. They should just be grateful. They should be glad that it's no longer causing them pain. But that doesn't mean that they're not suffering from pain. Isn't life better without, it, without the addiction? How many of you would, would, would argue with that, with that? Addiction is so much better than without addiction. Go ahead, raise your hand. I want to see you get chastised. No one. <clears throat> and the next one is, don't, you, don't they feel better when they're, when they're sober or off the bat? Don't they feel better? And the answer to that is no. Often they feel worse. And we're going to talk about the often they feel worse point. And, and, and why am I so sad? If I'm, if I'm trying to recover from substance abuse or gambling, why am I sad? So we're going to talk about that. So here's the question. How many of you have been in a relationship that didn't work out? <laughs> OK, so let me start with, with, you know, I stayed up most of the night thinking about this, and, and I don't know if it's going to work or not. How many of you remember your first love? OK, how many of you ended up in a relationship forever, so far you've been in the same relationship as your first love? One or two, or three, I see three, congratulations. So the rest of us have had this first love, so let's talk about your first love, okay? How many of you thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread? Man, oh man, am I in love. And I'll tell you a little story about my first love. She was wonderful, attractive, smart, in college. And I thought the world centered around her. And I committed everything and every bit of my energy to her, at least the idea of that, OK? And then one day, her father came up to the, to the place where I was and said, young man, this was after I asked her to marry me. Oh, I forgot that, didn't I? So I asked her to marry me because I was, I was in school and I thought, well, you know, this is the thing to do and I, 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 I really love this woman and, and I think that she's great. And her father came up to me and said, Jerry, you have nothing going for you. You come from the pa your past and that's not acceptable. And I don't want you to see my daughter ever again. And I said what every red-blooded male well, that's not your decision, it's hers. And she said, uh, I'm out. <laughs> now she was, you know, she cried a little bit. <laughs> so I got that going for me. Um, but I was devastated, okay? Because I had committed all of my, what I consider to be an immature love to one person. And it didn't work. It was negative. Okay? Now, when we talk about addiction and we talk about people that are having a relationship with chemicals or gambling, we're talking about a relationship that is a love relationship. How many of you believe that to be true? For those people who are in recovery that we call lived experience, you, will under you understand completely that it was something you invested everything into to the detriment of you, okay? And so I tell people all the time, I have no idea what people that have lived experience go through when they grieve because I haven't lived it. The closest thing I can is that love relationship that I had that was immature and didn't work. But when people have lived experience, they go through a painful process. And even though I, I've never experienced it, this is the, the, the corollary that goes with it, I know what grief is and I know how to help. But I, I will not stand here and say, I know exactly what you're going through. Because I don't. Now, I have 
not had a, a touch of alcohol for 43 years. <laughs> ah. And so you're all making the assumption that I had to stop drinking. Ah. Here's what happened. I was doing a practicum or an internship in a substance abuse program in 1979. And the boss said to me, we want to hire you, but we don't want you to drink while you're, in, while you're working for us. And I said to myself, self, I usually have these conversations. I don't have any friends, that's why. Um, so I said, self, do you want this job? And I said, yeah. Are you willing to not drink? I said, sure. There wasn't a grieving process around that. It was a decision I made to further my pocket. Okay? Then later on, when I was doing this in training, I found out that a lot of my family members that had substance abuse, that meant me that I was genetically predisposed. I said, another good reason not to. Now, I also went to treatment. How many people that don't have an alcohol or drug problem end up in treatment? I did. Because I took a job and they said, well, we put everybody through treatment first. So I went through treatment. So when I tell people, I've stopped drinking 43 years ago and I went through treatment, people are going like, wow. And yet I don't, the reason and my circumstances are different than the lived experience people. Now, for those of you that have been through treatment, I would never recommend that, never, never. <laughs> yes, I would. But it was painful, because I had to learn about a lot of other things about me. But as far as substance use, that wasn't the issue. So I don't have an understanding of that. I have an understanding of going through treatment. I have an understanding of grieving other things. I've lost my parents, my, ch my sister, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm different. And yet, I have worked with people that have gambling problems for 30-some years, and I know how to do it. And I've been successful. They've been successful. But, I, but I'm very clear on the fact that I don't understand the lived experience piece of that. I understand what recovery looks like, acts like, smells like, and feels like. But grief around substance abuse or gambling, I don't have. <clears throat> okay? That's to say, for those of you that just got turned off, you can do this work with or without lived experience. Okay? You can. Okay, so, so let's talk about grief. Grief is hidden, and, and, and people that are, that are in addiction, they hide their grief around this process. It's very hidden. In fact, when you're working with them, even in treatment, many times they're not giving away the pain they're in and the loneliness they're in and the, and the process of their, of, their, of their pain around that. And it, it, it can be, they can be extremely in denial of this process. I, I don't feel any. I don't feel sad at all about, about being off the bat or, or not drinking or doing drugs. I don't feel that. This is, you know, but in many, in most cases, they are. And it, could, it can be extremely painful. And these untouched emotions and grief can cause us to use and go back to using and go back to doing, going back on the bat. Um, I know that in, in the area of gambling, which is the expertise that, I've, that I have, people can think about gambling all their lives. And every day they wake up making another decision. And sometimes that decision is extremely hard. The example I use is I have a a very good friend of mine that does treatment with me uh, until I retired in Nebraska. And she, we came to Las Vegas to go to the national conference. 
And she had 20 years of experience of, of, of being off the bed. And I said to her, I said, you know, we need to make a plan in case this thing goes south on you. <laughs> and she said, I don't think that's going to be a problem. I've got 20 years. And I said, nah, I think we should work on this a little bit. <laughs> and so we made a plan. And the second day she walks in and she says, she, she couldn't get a, a hotel at this, <laughs> okay, she got a different hotel. <laughs> And so she was at one of the casinos, hotels, and she was walking through there. And oh, three hours later, four hours later, it's two o'clock in the morning, she calls me and she says, God, Jerry, I'm going gambling. And I said, oh, no, 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 you're not. And I said, where are you? She says, my room. I went to her room and I locked the door and I said, you're not leaving. And it was, a, it was a battle. But she didn't leave. And I said, what triggered you? And she said, the bells and the whistles at the casino. The ding, ding, dings. And I said, that, that triggered you? She was a sports better. And she wasn't ready for that. Gamblers are... are Think, have to make that decision, much like substance abusers, every single day. Is it better that I do or better that I don't? And that includes that grieving process. They have to grieve it every day. It's a little grieve, but it's a grief. You know, I tell people, I, I joke about this, I've never had a light beer. What am I missing? Anything? But I've never had, I mean, they didn't have, they, they didn't have you know, alcohol infused stuff. I, I can't even talk about that because I don't know. But I never had that stuff. Do I miss that stuff? Absolutely not. But gamblers miss it. Okay? Substance abusers miss it. Okay? And so they have issues that go along with that. So, so let's talk about those who struggle with addiction and grieve about their addiction. Let's talk about that. They grieve the loss of the addiction itself. The addict is going to miss their drug or their action. There's not a better high in the world than the addiction that, that caused them to do what they did. I don't care if they go jumping out, the, jumping out planes from then on out, it's not the same. And they have to grieve the loss of the high and the addiction itself. And when it comes to gambling, they have to, under, they have to grieve the fact that they are not going to be in the same place or space that they used to be. And that's wide ranging. Because when you think about it, I mean, C Carol, can I use you as an example? She sat here and talked about her children going, g getting food from the food pantry. Now you're saying to yourself, that's a bad thing. Okay, that's a bad thing. And they had to get clothes from the, from the, from, from the churches or, or, the, or whatever, where, where were they? Lost and, found. Lost and found. And that's a bad thing, right? But if it's your world and you're used to it, it's not necessarily a bad thing until such time as you get past the grief, grief of the process. It's when, when you first stopped using, when you first stopped gambling, can I ask you that question? When you first stopped, did you still go to the food pantry? Uh, no, no. Because she says no. Because that was her first step to stop. That was her first step to stop. I used to beat my children. Yeah. And yet, that was, I would have gone if I knew. right, yeah. and yet that was one of those things that she had to make a decision around. What would, you, what would have happened if she had woke up one day and there wasn't enough food? Do you think she would have gone? Absolutely. The lifestyle has to change. And when we're changing the lifestyle, those little things have to, you have to make decisions on little things 
and little things that most of, most of us don't even think about. I mean, I can honestly tell you that I have raised f f four, five, four children, <laughs> three of which were stepchildren, one is which is mine. I've raised all four of them, and uh, even me, so I guess that's five. Um, and they have never gone without food. Never. But I'll tell you one thing, I would have gone to the, I would have gone to the food bank if they needed it. And then I would have had to face the issue, and then grieve the issue, and then continue to talk about the issue, even though it's past. So let's move on. And rituals, let's talk about rituals. How many of you that work in substance abuse know about substance, abuse, substance users having rituals? You know what those mean? Somebody give me an example. It's your turn. Just say it out loud, it's okay. The act of using. The act, the, the act of going there and using, or wherever. The, that, routine. the routine of that ritual. Rituals are routines. You're doing it all the time. Okay, what else? Keep going. Setting things up not to be detected. Yeah, oh yeah, yes, you know. She said setting things up not to be detected. Um, I call that lying, cheating, and stealing. Um, <laughs> but I'm new here. Um, denial. denial is a ritual. But, and we'll talk about that too, a little bit of, more on that. In, in gambling, there are rituals also. What are some rituals for gamblers? Cashing your check at a casino. That every time I get my social security check, I cash it at the casino. Can you still do that? Uh, some jurisdictions you can, most you can't, but. Free spin, free drink. Free spin, free drink, yeah. I re <laughs> What's that? Yeah, plugging in. Plugging in's a ritual. I see a lot of people who plug in. They have it attached to their, to their body, and then they have that little cord. Favorite machines. Had a lady who said to me, I go to this one machine and I win all the time. And the reason I go to this one machine is because my dead son, I saw a vision of him there and I go there now because, you know, I want to see him and I want to feel him because he died. Now, that may not be the most sane thing in the world, but it was for her. And it was a ritual that she did. And if there was someone at that machine, what do you think she would do? Uh, she would outweigh, try to outweigh them. But then if she could not weigh them, what, what would she do? Chase them all. Chase them out. I mean, just stare at them. Stare them down. Yeah. Rituals. There are lots of rituals. When I gamble, how I gamble, what I gamble with, when... What, who, what you say, I, say, I know the swipers and the pull, pullers and the bingo players with the, the trolls and all of those are rituals. What's that, talking to the machine? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think a, IGT really cares about them talking to the machines, but they do anyway. Um, which, by the way, I have to say this as an aside. I, I was down there at the machines yes, yesterday, and I was watching, because I, I watch, and, I, and I, I played $20 because I played, and I saw this thing that said, if you have a gambling problem, call 1-800-BETS-OFF. And I thought to myself, I've been doing this since 1986, and my God, have we come a long ways. Because... We used to go out there and ask those people if we could put a sticker on the machines. Didn't we? I did. And they all would look at me like, are you a moron? <laughs> but now they do it. And, and, and thank goodness for that. Okay, so I got lost. I, I do these things. I go off on these tangents. When they come into counseling, they're still doing rituals. The rituals continue to happen over and over and over. 
And one of the things that I, have, I work on, worked on, because I am retired, um, is changing those rituals to more healthy processes. And, and we talk about the language that gamblers use. They don't use dollars and quarters. They use coins and what else? What other words do they use? Points. They use, they use language like instead of a hundred dollar bill, they say it's a a what? A, a Franklin? A Benjamin? They don't, they, they minimize dollars and the amount of money they put in. So they change the words. And I say every time they come in, say, okay, we're going we're gonna to talk about dollars and not coins. Because I need to make that real for them. Because rituals will lead them back. And we all do rituals. You know, I, you know, how many of you are, every Sunday, you go tro trooping on off to church on Sunday, same time, every week. That's a ritual. And if you're Catholic, you've got a lot of rituals around that. I was Baptist. We didn't have a lot of rituals. Sometimes it went an hour, and sometimes it went 14 hours. <laughs> but I can tell you I've done a lot of this. I don't know who I was waving to. <laughs> the relationships that people have in, in their addiction is part of the grieving process they have to do because the relationships have to change. Now, I, I said this along in many, many, for the last 30 years or 40 years or however many I've been doing this since 79. Um, alcoholics and gamblers both run in packs. And what I mean by that is gamblers and alcoholics run with people who gamble and drink or do drugs, the same as them. And why do they do that? This is not a hard question. Because you can't confront me because you're doing what I'm doing. This is a simple process. You know, if I go, when I go to the National Council or whatever, I come here, I see people, I hug them, and it's, it's a, you know, I, I have the same group of people for the last 30 years, Carol being one of them. They have the same group of people. They're all just doing what they're doing. So that has to change. Now, how do you change relationships? Do you just stop? Do you know how painful it is to just stop a relationship? Because then what's left? Yeah, what's left is me, myself, and I. And many times my gambling or my substance abuse has been to get away from me, myself, and I. And now I'm back to that. So I have to grieve that. Now, many, there was a guy that I was work, worked with in Arizona. I was talking about, you talked about Don, and, and Don was a, was a pill. But I was working with this guy in, in Arizona, he, and he said to me, I'm, I've got five years off the bet. He said, in recovery, and, but I, I want to change that to off the bet because it's not, you're sober, you're off the bet. I, I like the idea of individualizing, I'm off the bet. That's me, just me. You can do whatever you want. I'm not suggesting you have to, but I like it. So he says, I'm in recovery, and I've been five years. And I said, well, how's that going for you? He says to me, every day I get off work, I go home, I sit in my lazy boy, and I grip my chair and pray to God I don't gamble. And that's what early recovery was for many, many people. Because they've lost their relationships, and they don't have anything else. And back then, there, was not an, there wasn't a GA meeting in his area. And so he would have to travel two hours to get to a meeting that happened once a week. And, the, and so he went to that meeting. And then the rest of the time, he gripped his chair and prayed to God he wouldn't gamble. Because losing relationships, even though they are superficial, is more than he had. 
And so if you're going to work with people with addictions, you're going to have to work with changing playmates and playgrounds. I mean, AA's been talking about that for since what, 39? <laughs> and gamblers are in the same boat. They, they don't have a lot of relationships. And here's the other piece of the relationships they have. I think this is on the next slide. Is someone that, someone in the relationship, if they're married or something like that, don't expect the family members to be all excited about this process too. Because when you're in a relationship and you know your boundaries, even if your boundaries are bad, at least you're safe there. And so here's this person that comes in and the, I'll go on to the next one, nope. And, and so all of a sudden I am trying to do this recovery thing. I'm off the bed, I'm, I'm trying to do recovery, yada, yada, and, and my spouse is looking at me like, wow, this isn't the same person I know. And so many times they'll say things like, well, then if you're not going to gamble, how are we going to get our money? Because contrary to popular belief, gamblers do win. We think that everybody who comes into gambling hasn't won, and the truth of the matter is they've won a lot. They just put it all back. Okay, So we know that. So the, the gambler's spouse says things like, well, I'm not real comfortable with this because I'm used to the way it was. Much like in domestic violence. They know there's a, an up and a down and an up and a down and, and when they're in the, in the gambling frenzy, you get away from them and then when they feel the guilt and the pain, that's when you get what you want. Okay, and they have gotten that. And so they're a little bit reticent to stop this. Now let me, let me fl flip that on the other side. How many people walk into a treatment program, and the spouse walks in and says, if you could just get Jerry to, to drink more, it would be really cool. <laughs> you see the difference? The relationship is, if they just continue, only they do better at it, we're okay. I don't want to change this. I might be getting a lot of pain out of this, but at least I know what I'm doing. And I'm the one in charge of making sure the house gets, keeps intact, et cetera, et cetera. And all of a sudden, you, you get these people coming into treatment, and then, and then the counselor says something like, it's time to be responsible. And so they want to take that responsibility back. And what does the spouse say? Well, we have no idea what the long-term process is here. I'm not giving away anything to you because what happens if you get back on the bed? So they're not necessarily positive. So the relationship changes, but not necessarily in a positive way. Now, how many of you remember a GAF, the GAF scores of the DSM-4 GAF? For those of you that don't know what a GAF score is, I don't either. Um, it's a score that we all had to do, and, and they came in and they scored X number of, of on the GAF score. And that determined whether or not they were, what they were, whether or not they were healthy or not healthy. And I'm, I'm over-dramatizing this, and please understand. And, and what, you know, how much trouble they were in, et cetera, et cetera. And then we were asked to give the GAF score 30 days later, okay? And if I'm a substance abuser, my GAF score gets better after 30 days. Why? Because I haven't used for 30 days. Unless I'm lying, of course, which occasionally that happens. Not very often, but occasionally. If I stop using for 30 days, my body's going to start clearing, and I'm going to start feeling better about what's going on. Now, my life's nowhere near good, but it's a little bit better, just a little. Now, compare that to the gambler. What happens 30 days into a gambler's life? It gets worse. Why does it get worse? Because, you know, when we first started doing this for the state of Nebraska, 
I was the provider, and, and I, I turned in the GAF score, and 30 days later, I turned in the GAF score, and they said, Jerry, you're, you're just a horrible counselor. <laughs> and, you know, and that's probably true, but not based on the GAF scale. Okay? Why do they get worse? Because 30 days later, one thing happens. The bills come in. And how do you guys feel about when the bills come in? Is it a good day? I mean, my wife and I keep track of our bills, and we pay our bills together, and we do all the things that, that we're supposed to do. And, and, and cool, real honestly, we have budgets and things like that because we, we do that with, I did that with gamblers, and I thought, this is a great plan for my life. And so I, my wife and I do budgets, and we have not fought in 15 years about money because we know where it's going, okay, because we have a budget. But 30 days into this process, you probably don't have a budget with your gambler. And there, the bills are coming in, and they're saying to themselves, holy jeepers, what am I going to do now? And what do they do? They think about gambling. They're not feeling better, they're feeling worse. And the relationships with their spouses and people that are around them are supportive of that. You see, when you start grieving the relationships, you have to make changes. And when you start making those changes, it affects everyone. And not everybody wants that change. Not everybody feels in the same position that you do. So the gambler comes back and, and they want to take on accountability and you know they want to do some recovery things, et cetera, et cetera, and the spouse is saying, I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm down for that. Um, and yet, isn't recovery based on you getting back to a life that you're a responsible citizen? So we are in direct conflict many times in our relationship build, building, rebuilding, as a, as, a, as a substance abuser, as a gambler, I'm sitting there saying, I, I, I need to be responsible, I need to, I need to work more, I need to do this, whatever I gotta do, I gotta do this. And they're saying, nah, not necessarily. And here's the other piece about that with spouses. If I'm responsible in my life, you may not need me. And addicts, Family members of addicts, both sides, gamblers and substance abuse, go through this. If you're in recovery, you may not need me. And we couch it like, well, you know, when we get into recovery, then we may not, we might not recognize the other person because we've been so far apart so long. Well, I, let me change the scenario on that a little bit to say, if I'm in recovery and I'm trying to be responsible and I'm trying to do this and I'm trying to do that, all of a sudden I'm taking on the world and I feel good about taking on the world because this is what my counselor told me to do. And the spouse is looking at me going like, you may not need me and you definitely don't need me the way that I was. However that was. And each individual family member has that difference. And loss of predictability. You know, addicts in recovery can actually be more moody. <laughs> I know that's hard to believe. But when I'm trying very hard to be sober or off the bet, and I'm doing all this grieving of loss of my relationships and loss of my of my friendships, and, and now I'm, you know, I'm having to go to this treatment center, and you know, they're confronting me. Now, they're very nice about it. They're just asking me, well, how did that work for you? And then I come home, and, and my spouse says, well, how'd it go? <laughs> and what do I do? Boom. <laughs> they confronted the heck out of me, da -da -da -da, or whatever they did, or whatever I have. I can be more moody in this, in this change than I was before because I was distant before. 
when I'm, when I'm gambling four or five days a week and I'm not coming home, you get used to being without me. But now I'm coming home every day, going to treatment every day, I'm doing this thing, and now I'm more moody than I was because my counselor's asking me to identify my feelings. <laughs> Anybody not do that in treatment? Well, how does that make you feel? Well, this is a new process for me. You know, I, I'm, in this recovery process, I'm thinking to myself, I didn't want to do that, and I like to do that. Now, you're not, the, only, the, only, the only thing I can feel is anger. I feel good about that. And then I feel sadness because I've lost this, this lifestyle that was so important to me. And the losses for gamblers, once they make this decision to, to change their life, the losses can't be recouped. Think about that. Think about that. People who come into treatment aren't coming in $50 down. They're coming in thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars down. And all of a sudden they wake up one day and someone says, mostly the casinos, I'm sorry, when you lost that money, it became ours. And they're nice about it, they're really nice about it, but it's the truth. And we point it out to them. I say, Mary, when you lost that money, it became their money. It's not your money. You're not chasing it anymore. It's their money, and you have to stop chasing it. And they have, they have to grieve all that lost money. In addition to the relationships and the, and the family dynamics, now I've got money I lost. Now we know that if, when a person decides to be in recovery, the, the odds are, that's a gambling term, the odds are that if they stop gambling, they usually make enough money that they can, they can go forward and be okay. They don't know that. And they've got a lot of bills to pay back, a lot, mostly credit cards, but mo might be some bad checks involved in that and some other things. Some payday loans, yeah. Some pay, you know, don't let me talk about payday loans. Anybody here work for payday loans? Because I want you to be chastised. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm not a real payday loan fan. I, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm, because the states usually have them one, and then, but the gamblers go to 12. And, the, and, they, and, the, and they, should, they should do some more regulation around that. That's a government thing. So anyway. There's, there's a lot of money to be paid back as well as money that they're never going to get back. And by the way, I'm not going to make it through all these, these slides, but they're yours anyway, because did I mention I'm retired? And you can, ha and you can have them. <laughs> so part of this process is they have to go through a blaming process. And we're, we're going to talk a little, about a little bit of that. And, and, I'll do, uh, in case we don't get to it, I know that people who stop gambling spend a little bit of time blaming others and the entities that which they gambled. Not a lot, but some. You know, they'll say things like, well, they took all my money knowing full well I had a gambling problem. Well, it's entirely possible they're the only ones that knew they had a gambling problem. Because, let me tell you a story about an alcoholic friend of mine. He did not want everybody to know he's an alcoholic. So, he was, he was a genius. So on Monday nights he went to this bar. And on Tuesday nights he went to this bar. And on Wednesday nights he went to this bar. And on Thursday nights he went to that bar, et cetera, et cetera. And not one single bar owner or anyone had any idea he had an alcohol problem. Because he was only there once a week. <laughs> I consider that to be genius. Now, a little bit off the beam, and that's what addiction is. But, but gamblers do that same thing too. Carol talked about when she was gambling, she didn't plug in at the end. Why didn't she? You don't want them to know. 
they're, they're good at that, okay? So somewhere along the lines, they have some sense of that, there's, that they're going to be unhappy, and they do a little blaming. You know, if you had a wife like mine, you'd drink too. Um, and I'm trying to get sober, and my wife is against me. Um, you know, the casinos, they took all my money, and, you know, all I got out of it was the T-shirt. So there's a little bit of that blaming piece that goes on with that. And that's a little bit of the denial process. That, and you'll hear them when they talk about those things. And they will talk about their denial in a variety of different ways. But you need to be aware that they're talking about denial in order to maintain this relationship because it's a love relationship they don't want to give up. I mean, when, when, the, when this ex-girlfriend's father came up and said, uh, Jerry, this is the last time you get to see her, I was in total denial of that. I thought, well, you know, we'll just, we'll cool it for a little while and then, you know, we'll get back together. Well, it didn't work that way, but I believed it would work that way. And I've had people that come to gambling treatment and they stay a year. And then they say, I'm leaving. And I say, why? I said, well, I, I bet myself I could go without gambling for a year, and I've done it, and... <laughs> do you have substance abusers that do that? Absolutely. You see some similarities here? This addiction process has some differences and some di similarities. Um, and, and here's the other piece that, that recovery causes. Recovery causes resentments about time. When I'm in recovery and I'm going to groups a couple of times a week or I'm going to GA two or three times a week and I'm doing this and I'm doing that and the spouse is looking around going like, what? Do you have that in substance abuse? Where the, the, the treatment is worse than the, than the, than the problem? at least to the family? Because gamblers will say things like, well, you know, I got to get a second job because I got to pay back all these bills. So they're working full time and then they're working part time and they're never home. And the spouse is like, well, I'm still doing the same dang thing. And so there's resentments. And then when the spouse says something along the lines of, Absolutely. Are you going to another one of them yeah. blank meetings? I wish I, I, I can I say that? Um, <laughs> the, 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 the pain of recovery is, is painful because they, everybody has to grieve the change. And, and, the, and as I, as a, a person trying to recover, say things like, this is exactly what you wanted. You wanted me to go to treatment, I'm there. You want me to go to GA or AA, I'm there. You want me to bring in more money, I'm doing it. And now you're complaining about not seeing me again. What do you want? You want to be poor? But I'll be sober. I'll be off the bed, but we'll be poor. The, the, the time of treatment becomes a grieving process too. So as counselors, you know, one of the things we talked about working with gamblers is they need to be seen more often than was once a week. They really do. But there, there's a huge issue around how much time and energy are we putting into this. And so one of the things that I learned how to do right away was they have this goofy thing called texting. It's a newfangled thing. It's brand new to the world. But I would have my gamblers text me how they're doing between sessions. If I have a 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock, I get out at 1.50, I have 10 minutes. Text me how you're doing. If, if we're working on an assignment, send me the assignment via the, via the computer and we'll go over it and I'll, I'll give you information back and forth when we're not in session. Because the key to this recovery piece is changing everything in your life 
and yet we have to do this in a place and a time that can allow them to have a life. And what a hard thing to do. And you wonder why we have a very low recovery rate for, for gambling. Because it's so, it's so fun when the fun stops. <laughs> it's so fun. And even when it's not fun, there's so many rituals and there's so many, so many people and places depend on you to gamble, at least in your own mind. It's hard to make those changes. So, so how, do we, how do we face this grieving process? So let's talk about Kuva Ross. How many of you have read On Death and Dying, or is it just me? Okay, so here's the truth about On Death and Dying. She, did a, she, she interviewed people that were, were dying from cancer, okay? How does that fit with people who are trying to recover from gambling? It doesn't, but yet it does. Now, I, I, I'm online researching, because I can do that, and there, there are people that say there's 12 steps in recovery, in, in, in grieving. And other people say there are three steps. Okay, can we agree that there are probably a lot of steps when it comes to grieving? Okay, but one of the things that we can talk about is the process and using some of those words to go back and talk about it. So we want to talk about, first of all, denial. Now, Kubler-Ross is not the expert of all around gambling or substance abuse, so let's be very clear for those of you that are turning me off right now. It's okay, you can come back when we're done. Um, but, but it's important to talk, to use words, to define things. And so, you know, they may not be the best words, but at least we have words to define things. And denial is one of those. And addicts utilize denial to avoid responsibility for their substance abuse or their behavioral acting out. They use denial. Anybody here? seen a client ever that was, that was totally without denial in your treatment program? Look around, folks. None. Gamblers are the same way. They come in and they say, I, I've had so many people come in and it says, Jerry, gambling counselor, and they walk in the door and they say, Jerry, I got, I got a problem with my gambling, and 20 minutes later they're saying, yeah, I think I'm okay now. <laughs> and I realize how good I am. No, 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 this is denial. They have a moment of clarity and the moment of clarity goes away and they get back into the denial process. Make sense? Okay, and it's, it's you know, reality is for those who can't handle fantasy um, and, and gambling's all about fantasy and who, would who wants to live in reality versus fantasy? I, I, I wanna live in a fantasy world, I really do. I, I, I can't yet, I'm trying, but but I want to. I want to live in a world where, you know, everything is, you know, like, I can just sit here and say things like, I'm way cool, and everybody believes it. Okay? I want to live in that world, but I don't get to. And no one does. Okay? But gambling is all about fantasy. And if I can live in a world of fantasy, and for those of you that don't believe me, how many of you have bought a lottery ticket? and said to yourself, here's what I'm gonna do when I, buy, when I win. Don't tell me you're not in fantasy. <laughs> Keith's over there going like, not me. Um, but that's fantasy. We all do it. We all try to live in it. The question is, do we, ha do we come back to reality? And the answer is, it's so very hard for people who are in trying to recover to get into reality. It's a very hard process. So, the next piece of that is, yeah, I don't want to skip this. Um, these are just examples. And the second stage, now, not, I think everybody in the early stages of the recovery have a bit of denial. But some people don't have anger. But a lot of people do. Just because they're in denial of their anger, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I've had people that can't come into my office that had gambling issues that said things like, oh, thank God. Thank God it's over. And they really meant it. Thank God it's over. And I'll do whatever it takes because I can't do this anymore. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. 
not too many, but I've had some. But you're going to see anger come out in your groups with both substance abusers and gamblers. How do you see gambler? How do you see substance abusers do do anger? How do you do that? This is your turn. They numb. Yeah, they just go away. Yeah. Any anything else? How do they show anger in treatment with you? They act like a two-year-old? They two a fit? Yeah. So it's just so it's just not me then. Okay. They don't show up. You want the ultimate of on the horse you rode in on is I don't even I didn't even show up. And part of that also is I show up late. Bec and then they have, yeah, they have things like, oh, I can't get my assignment done. I can't do this or I can't do that. They have ways of showing you that they're still not accepting of this process. Okay? What's it? They whine? Yeah. Five dollars for whining? I, I owe you 50. Um, <laughs> I, you know, they, they're similar in this process in that they, they will show you anger and it will come up in treatment and they will, they will displace that to wherever else they think they can get away with it. Okay? If I can take you on a rabbit trail and tell you that it's my spouse and, and let me tell you about my spouse, believe me, there's some real problems she's got then I am displacing that anger towards recovery and putting it onto her, okay? Now, it's the other way, too. Females do that to males, too. It's, I, I just happen to be male. Um, and, and my wife doesn't do that, by the way. Please understand, I'm making examples, so when, if you happen to see her today, you don't think she's a horrible person because I really love her, <laughs> okay? Okay, so moving on, bargaining. Have you seen bargaining in your, in your sessions? I think I can do this thing twice a week and maybe three, four hundred dollars a time. Well, how much can you afford? Let's, let's work on your budget. Your budget says you can afford once a week and twenty-five dollars. Walk me through that. Well, I think we can stop feeding the children. <laughs> And believe me, I, this, these, are, these are examples that are real in my life. There, I have people that said the children don't need to eat as much. Yeah, you're saying to yourself, oh, wow, that guy's really in bad shape. No, that's not. That's a person who is in love with their relationship with gambling and can't see the end of not doing it. Okay? Now, am I personally affronted by that? Yeah, I guess so. No, absolutely, I am. But do I understand what gamblers will do to bargain? Or, or substance abusers, you know? What about if I only, if I only drink on Thursdays? <laughs> harm harm, I love harm reduction. Yeah, then I can, only, I can only drink on Thursdays. Or days that end with Y. I'll only drink beer, yeah. If, if you, you know, I promise I won't smoke the weed anymore, I'll just drink. Or I won't drink, I'll just smoke the weed. Anybody taking CBD? You know, I mean, I have had six surgeries on my feet. They hurt every single day of my life. I'm thinking about the CBD thing. I know my dogs take it. How do they get CBD and not me? pouting, whining. Okay, so then we go on to bargaining. The partners also bargain. They bargain a lot, both substance abuse and gambling. But, but let me talk about the gamblers. They, they spend a lot of time bargaining the relationship, the continued gambling, and what's going to happen next. They, they continually bargain around that. And, and I mean, it's really true that the spouses of gamblers many times 
don't want their gambler to stop. They just don't want them to get in trouble anymore. So depression. Have you seen depression inside of substance abuse or gambling? Absolutely. If you haven't, you're not looking. Yeah, internalized anger, okay? You've seen it. How do you deal with it? Sometimes they need medication. Sometimes they need lifestyle changes. Sometimes they need to talk through this process. There's a variety of ways to talk about depression, but please understand gamblers and substance abusers both go through depression. I had a, a client that I was working with. When I met her, she came into the office with her family, and her family said, here's what happened. And I, if you've heard this story, I apologize, but it's really a good story. We're bringing my mother in because she had a gun to her head and she was going to commit suicide because of her gambling. And he happened to walk in on her after she shot into the ceiling to find out what the recoil was before she put it to her head. Okay? So, think there's depression there? <laughs> Maybe a little bit. Sadness, but nothing else. So, I I said, okay, I put my counseling hat on and said, we probably should put her in an inpatient setting for safety. You know, I, I'm smart. And she said, absolutely, I will stay the 72 hours and then I will kill myself. And I said, well, what are you willing to do? She says, I'm willing to come see you until such time as I don't feel like killing myself. I thought, okay. And so we made a plan, and the plan was that the family members would sleep with her at night. She would get in, in with me on a regular basis, and we worked with her for six months before she said, I don't think I want to kill myself now. Six months. Now, am I a bad counselor, or is, is there a lot of grieving that has to happen here? And when you're already sad, because here's what happened. She had lost, she got an inheritance from her parents when they died of well over a million dollars. And then when she, her husband decided to have an affair with her business partner, and so they left together. So she was out of a business, and she had several million dollars in her pocket and she gambled every bit of it away. When I saw her, she was 66 years old, and she was trying to figure out how she was ever going to make it, because her retirement wasn't very much. Well, I would be depressed too. She just lost all of her safety nets in a, in a, in a period of like two and a half years. So, she was in treatment for a while, by the way. She's doing fine. She had, she had spent her time eliminating her family. She wouldn't go see them. She wouldn't take their calls. She wouldn't do anything with them because she was so ashamed of her gambling issue. So we re-engaged the family. She now spends a lot of time with her family. Uh, in fact, last time I talked with her, she, would, she was just spent two weeks out in Carmel, Carmel, California to see her grandkids. She's happy as a bug. Um, and she was a, a let, me, let me also suggest, without trying to give away too much, she was a champion, national champion quilter. And, I mean, she made quilts that, you know, amazing stuff. And she had given that up, too. Because they had a quilting shop with her, with her best friend, and... Yeah, you know the end. Okay, so acceptance. What does acceptance mean? You know, ex you know what acceptance means? I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm getting better. I don't think about it as often. 
I don't put myself in a position where I'm going to be in trouble as often. I'm pretty responsible in my life. Do you know, you guys know this, in substance abuse, what do you think the time frame for that is on an average, federal average? Because all those statistics come out of the federal government. None of the substance, I mean gambling, but what, what's the average length of recovery before the acceptance happens? Two to five years. Two to five years before it gets comfortable, okay? Gamblers are in similar positions. What we try to do with them financially is to put their budgeting out to pay back their bills from five to seven so that we can get a bigger jump on this recovery process. And what does recovery mean? And here's what people ask me, how will I know when I'm in recovery? And the answer to that is, is when all the DSM criteria aren't, you don't have them anymore, and you say to yourself, if I meet somebody today and I don't tell them I had a gambling problem, they would never know because my life is full of the rest of my life. So when people ask me what recovery is, that's what I tell them. When, you, when people meet you and they don't, they don't see you as an addict, they see you as a person with a life that's full. And let me end it with this. I, had a, I have a brother-in-law who is, he's 65, 66, 66 now. He's a year older than I am. He was a drug dealer in New Jersey. He also was a user. So I think more of, he was a mule. So he got popped and they put him in prison. And he was mad. But when you're carrying that much meth, yeah, you're probably gonna go to prison, okay? So he went to prison. He came out. And he started going to Alcoholics Anonymous, he started going to Cocaine Anonymous, he started going to you know, several others. And right now in his life, he works as a printer. He's, he's, he's got more artistic skills than most people that you would know. He's, he's brilliant when it comes to that. And he volunteers every weekend at the Houston shelter for animals. And has been doing that. He raises money every year to take care of the dogs that would be put down because they need surgery. He, he raises money for that. And they raise hundreds of thousands of dollars for the dogs and the cats that would be otherwise put down. He, he's, he's my hero. Um, my wife, when she met me, she said, I want you to be like him. I haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> I probably never will. But he is recovery. And you all know him. You all know the people in recovery. I'm going to pick on Carol. I know Carol's in recovery. I feel it in my bones that she's in recovery. And I hang out with her because I like it. What she does, I like. Okay? And that's what we mean by acceptance. And there's a bunch of other stuff in here that, that you're going to have to do on your own because I'm running out of time. Because I can talk forever. But thank you for putting up with me. I appreciate it. Have fun, have fun at lunch.